Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session, Making Compliance Cloud Native. Thank you, KubeCon. Um, thank, uh, my name is Zeal, and I'm a security and compliance specialist with Google Cloud. Hi, I'm Ann Wallace, security solution manager with Google Cloud. Thank you, Ann. So today, we are going to talk about how to meet compliance requirements in a cloud native way mainly on containers, as we all know that co compliance can be quite complex and challenging, and it can slow you down on your modernization journey. So let's understand this problem first. Uh, whether you are a regulated bank or an e-commerce store, running a regulated workload is quite complex. Why? Because you have multiple stakeholders. You have the makers and the checkers, the makers, which is you know mainly your developer community, and then um, the checkers, your, your security folks, your risk and compliance folks, and then you know legal. Um, your workloads have stringent compliance requirements, and mostly they are legacy. Because of this complexities, regulated workloads are slowest to move to the cloud and modernize. Now, Having said that, as these workloads are primed for modernization and to become cloud optimized, containers and Kubernetes are, a, are favored within our makers community, mainly for two reasons. One, it enables microservices and a service oriented architecture. So you can break apart a large giant monolith into smaller chunks and you can run it you know, at different places, giving you better flexibility and agility. Um, it allows for multi-cloud and hybrid deployments. Uh, our checkers, which you know our security folks, our risk and govern governance folks, they love them too because you can inherit a lot of security defaults from your cloud provider, and it allows for blue and green deployments uh, to reduce the downtime and to reduce downtime and business continuity risks. However, not everything is hunky dory. A compliance conversation is always incomplete without an independent regulator or an auditor, which brings us to regulatory audits which are cyclical, seasonal, and can make our makers and checkers a little anxious. Why? Um, so when, when you look at, when you closely look at an audit, there are two main steps. One, you have to scope the audit accurately and you have to evidence the controls. Um, with a monolith, you basically have, you know, one front end, one back end, and one app server. Um, so it's really easy to, you know, scope um, scope the monolith or scope the audit and, you know, evidence the control on the uh, on, on a monolith versus as you move, uh, as, as you move towards microservices with containers, you have these containers running in different cloud providers, you enter into a shared responsibility. It's hard to draw a boundary. It's hard to evidence the shared responsibility um, as there are multiple con control owners. This is another why. In general, audits can be quite daunting because of the things on the left hand side, right? The compliance frameworks are not cloud native. It takes a village to pass an audit, fear of misconfigurations, and then evidencing the shared responsibility. So, how do we make this experience, you know, um, uh, pain free or you know more pleasant? And we are going to talk through this during the rest of our presentation. Simply put, you want to shift left and declare your compliance outcome as a code. So I've talked a lot about challenges or the problem statement which comes with compliance and you know it becoming a cloud native. The, the underlying question is, what are these compliance requirements? So what we've done is we've looked at different compliance frameworks such as PCI DSS, NIST 853 for FedRAP, 27001. Um, and what we see is that the compliance requirements fall in one of these five buckets. We'll cover some of these areas in our presentation. So let's start with segmentation and networking. Segmentation and networking can look challenging with containers, especially um, with all the requirements on the left, um, you know, things that I mentioned on the left has to be demonstrated to, to your auditor. Um, it, and it, that, that becomes, you know, quite cumbersome. So let's dig a little bit deeper on you know, what segmentation is um, and how does it relate to compliance frameworks. With most compliance frameworks, segmentation is re really not a compliance requirement, but it is a best practice. It is an opportunity for you to demonstrate to your auditor what is in scope versus out of scope and establish a strong audit boundary. When you have proper segmentation and networking controls in place, your audit will go really fast. Being an auditor myself, um, you know, I ask uh, the first thing that I ask my auditees is show me your audit boundary. 
With respect to containers, um, when we speak about segmentation, it's mainly two types of segmentation. Segmentation around the cluster, which is macro segmentation, where you segment the users, networks, and applications, and then segmentation inside the cluster, things that you would do inside a cluster to keep your pods isolated. So let's spend some time understanding the both types of segmentation. Let's start with cluster networking um, or cluster segmentation. Within a cluster, each pod has its own IP. To segment the pods, use network policies. Network policies work similar to VPC firewall rules, so you can allow or deny traffic based on IP rules. Building upon that segmentation, now you have segmented the pods within the cluster, but you further need to demonstrate separation of dev and test environments versus the prod environment to your auditor. You, or you need to segment application profiles where one application contains sensitive information versus other doesn't. This is where you use namespaces. So now let's pivot to macro segmentation as, as you need stronger isolation. Um, you, you want to segment your users, you want to segment your networks and the application around. Um, and this is where you could use something like service mesh, service mesh such as Istio and a service proxy such as Envoy. Istio is a lot of things, but fundamentally it is an open framework for connecting and securing services. So let's check through the components of a service mesh. Here is the with an example. Uh, one, you have an on uh, you have a network proxy here. With, it is Envoy that intercepts the service to service communication. Then uh, you have Pilot, which runs the control plane. Number three is Mixer that enforces security policies. And then uh, uh, number four is Citadel that offers service to service authentication via a certificate authority. So, you know, architecturally, this is great, but what compliance outcomes can be expressed via service mesh? Um, so things like session timeouts for services. It is a common compliance requirement to authenticate back to a service after a period of uh, inactivity. And you can set this, you can explicitly set this, uh, or you can enforce conditional routing. For example, assets in mesh A can only talk to assets in mesh B under certain conditions. You can also enforce NTLS uh, for service-to-service -service communication or service-to-end-user communication to ensure encryption in transit. So we spoke, you know, we spoke a little bit about service mesh, and it establishes a strong boundary. But how to keep, you know, the next step is how to keep the assets inside the boundary private, which is again, you know, a common compliance requirement. This is where this is where you need to net into your Kubernetes footprint, and you have two options. You can use the manage you can use a managed net from your cloud provider, or you can use an open source tool like Caligo that integrates well with other service meshes. Kubernetes private cluster. Um, this is another great feature um, that allows you to keep things private. An important compliance checkbox um, in private cluster. Um, you have two options. You, you know, you have your connection from master to node completely private through VPC peering uh, of the cloud provider, or you can make that endpoint public where you can allow certain IP addresses to connect to the master. So this will allow, this is really a good use. This is a great use case for road, road warrior use cases where developers and admins are working remotely and they need to access the master over the internet. To sum up, this is how you build segmentation in and around a cluster and demonstrate a strong audit boundary. Um, however, a common question I get is that, you know, this is great, Kubernetes is great, networking with it is great, but how do I communicate those controls to my auditor? My auditor does not understand con containers and cloud, so how do I explain these concepts to them? Being an auditor myself, I can relate to this really well, um, you know, on, on the other side of the table. This is where I, uh, you know, this is where simple diagrams or uh, tools that that lay out these concepts well will help. Anne has a section, um, has a separate section on empathizing with auditors where she covers how a simple tool, uh, you know, or a simple diagram can really ease such a conversation. So let's move on to data protection. 
With data protection, it's all about, you know, encrypting all things, well, almost all things everywhere. Ensure your app is FIPS validated or FIPS compliant if there's a need for one. Um, uh, and then, you know, if you're using encryption for data protection, you, you want to have strong key management procedures. So, you know, for, 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 for data in flight, um, as I mentioned before, a great, um, great control is use of service mesh. At rest, you can use the KMS or an HSM from your cloud provider to encrypt, tokenize, or, uh, or redact, um, redact or you know, mask your data. And then another um, common area of protection is secrets. So let's look into it a little bit deep, uh, uh, deeper. So you might say, you know, with Kubernetes, um, are the secrets already encrypted in etcd? No, they are not because they are base64 encoded and they are not, uh, which is not encryption. Anyone with ac access to etcd um, has access to the secrets in plain text. Hence, it is important to protect your Kubernetes secrets. And we recommend to use envelope encryption. Envelope encryption is the practice of encrypting data with a with one key, which is called the data encryption key, and then you encrypt the that key with a different key. So we've talked about you know our, uh, data protection um, and and the three areas. Now let let's quickly go through some uh, must do's um, as you look at cloud native technologies. So step number one or number one, you know, have a time to live on your data. Beyond your TTL, make sure the data is securely deleted, uh, especially if the data is residing in the cloud. Um, you want to shred the keys. You, and, and if it is residing in the cloud, you also want to understand how, to, how the data deletion works within your cloud provider, with your cloud provider, because you will need to explain this to your regulator. Maintain an asset inventory. Track data and metadata accurately on-prem, uh, as well as, you know, with, with with your assets, which sits in different clouds. Uh, number two, familiarize. Number three, familiarize with the shared responsibility as you consume KMS and HSM services from your cloud providers. Make sure you also understand your responsibilities with respect to FIPS 140-2 compliance. Um, you know, FIPS 140-2 has different uh, different levels of compliance. Understand which encryption modules from your cloud provider are FIPS validated or not. And lastly, key management. You, the main thing with key management is to set rotation policies for your keys. Um, and if you're using you know, envelope encryption, if you have DEX and KEX, you want them to be separate. Um, you want to keep the KEX at least equally strong or stronger than the DEC. This is all I have, and I will pass it on to Anne. Great. Thanks, Steele. Uh, next slide. Cool. So now we're going to talk about supply chain. So some of the questions and requirements you'll need to answer with regard to your supply chain are making sure your container images are vulnerability free, ensuring the images you deploy to production are trustworthy, and then life cycle management of your containers. So if we look at the different stages of the software supply chain, first a developer checks code into Git, then an image is built, and then tests are run. So as your container images are being built and pushed to your registry, they might be scanned for known security vulnerabilities and categorized based on CVE rankings. This is a common compliance requirement. And then at the deploy stage, you can use tools like uh, Open Policy Agent or Cretus to create deployment policies and deny deployment in your environments based on these policies. So let's look at this. I don't have enough time to dive into all the details of Kubernetes Admission Controller or Open Policy Agent, but the TLDR is Open Policy Agent or OPA is a CNCF project. It's a policy engine that can be used to enforce policies across multiple parts of your stack, such as Kubernetes, Terraform, or Infrastructure as Code, and an API authorization. And then an API, an admission controller is a piece of code that intercepts the request to the Kubernetes API server prior to persistence of that object. And then the request is authenticated and authorized. These are static and dynamic, there are st st there are static and dynamic controllers. And we're gonna focus on the dynamic controllers are also known as emission webhooks. So if we look at Kubernetes with open policy agent, first the kube API server sends a Kubernetes object into the webhook um, 
request to OPA. OPA then evaluates the policies it has loaded. Then OPA policies generate an emission review response that is sent back to the API server. A minimal response of true or false. Um, and also note that policies can be loaded as a config map. So in the case of PCI, maybe we have an e-commerce store that's selling some hipster items. We'll call it hipster store. Um, so they want to make sure that all their load balancer traffic is over port 443. So they have created a policy. So on the left, we have an OPA policy written in Rego. In a nutshell, this checks first if the kind of object B is a service and the request is of the operation is create and that the port is not 443. If it is, then they deny the request and print an error message. And again, this can be loaded as a config map. And then on the right, we have a load balancer service. Uh, this would fail uh, when created since it's trying to use port 80. To recap, the Kubernetes API server is configured to query OPA for emission control decisions when objects like pods or services are created, updated, or deleted. So I want to touch on one, well, technically two more use cases for OPA. They both involve Terraform. So our friends at uh, Hipster Store use Terraform for infrastructure as code to build out their cloud infrastructure. They want to be able to catch possible problems pre-deployment, but they also want to be able to give their compliance team a way to pre periodically audit Terraform state files against their policies to make sure what is running or has run was in compliance. So in this example, for compliance reasons, they only want their clusters deployed in the EU. So the Rego parses the input file, which is the Terraform state file for resources that match a Google container cluster and sets the location. If passed, uh, the location will have started with the uh, EU. <clears throat> so now our friends at Hipster Store have policies for the infrastructure they wanna make sure are they're using while deploying containers that meet their compliance requirements. So they make sure that only trusted images are deployed into their environments. To do this, they are using open source projects, Grafeus and Cretus. So Grafeus is a centralized meta knowledge base with information on vulnerabilities, build information, et cetera. Build and auditing tools can use the Grafeus API to store, query, and retrieve comprehensive metadata on software components of all kinds. And then Cretus is a Kubernetes policy engine that helps real-time enforcement of container policies at deploy time uh, for Kubernetes clusters based on the attestation of container image properties. So things like build provenance and test status, and these are typically stored in Grafeus. It's worth noting that while Cretus is a Kubernetes specific project, Grafeus can be used to store uh, more than just container image metadata. So the Cretus policy example on this page shows a policy used to prevent deployment of pods with the critical uh, vulnerabilities, unless that vulnerability has been whitelisted. So putting this all together, when a developer code is checked in a GitHub, it triggers a build, and in this case, it's cloud build. Cloud build then generates a new container image. It will create a build record that contains information on the image, including the location of the source from which the image was built. A vulnerability scan is also done, and then the results of that scan are stored as part of the metadata for that container in Grafeus. When a deployment request is made, the pod spec, which includes the container that was just built, goes to the Kube API server, and like OPA, Cretus is deployed as an emission controller webhook. Cretus checks the policy against the metadata and attestation stored in Grafeus and either accepts or rejects the deployment into the hipster cluster. Okay, runtime security. So runtime security allows you to identify containers acting maliciously in production or any other environment and take action to protect your workload. So we just talked about how to validate compliance requirements before you even deploy something into production, but what about post deployment? In other words, you did all this work to make sure your containers are gonna be secure and meet compliance requirements, but how do you make sure it stays that way? So when we look at some of the compliance requirements that you need to meet, a lot of them say, yes, you really need to log all the things, but there are very specific things you need to log and monitor. You need to be able to track events back to the actual user. You need to monitor for security events. And then your logs need to contain information like user event, date and time, and et cetera. So many logs really don't change significantly for containerized environments. For example, network logs look pretty much the same. As long as you can tie an IP address back to a single pod rather than the node it's running on. 
Um, we typically focus on four types of logs, so your infrastructure logs, Kubernetes logs, OS logs, and application logs. All of these have the concept of audit logs. So if you're looking to figure out why something is the way it is in your environment, who, who made it that way, you're going to use audit logs. So let's look at these in a little bit more detail. So Kubernetes audit logs are actions taken in Kubernetes. So a given request will generate events at multiple points in the life cycle. So when a request is received, when a response is started, when a and when a response is completed. The Kube API server processes these events according to your audit logging policy, and then we'll log them. And just like other types of logs, Kubernetes log events can be at a different depths of detail um, based on the information that's included with them. So Kubernetes offers four audit log levels, none, so nothing's logged at all. Metadata, which logs a metadata only, and this includes requesting user, timestamp, resource, and a verb. Um, and then request, which logs the metadata plus the request body. And then request response, which logs the metadata rest request response um, plus the request response body. So now let's look at all this together. Where do the logs come from and where do they go? So your infrastructure logs, which are probably your cloud logs, like API um, calls to your cloud provider, come from your cloud provider. Um, it might go into a central bucket or somewhere else. Um, Kubernetes logs and audit logs come from Kubernetes, and you can use something like FluentD to collect these. And then OS logs and, and audit logs and application logs. Again, these are something that you can collect using FluentD. So if you're running a logging agent yourself, you want to send all these logs to a central logging system. And again, you want to get all your logs into a central place. This makes it easier to filter over all the logs in case of a possible event um, that's occurred in your environment. <clears throat> this also means you need to be really careful about having consistent identifiers for the same resources across different log types so that you can easily correlate these events. And then you also wanna set up backup of the, these logs or some subset of these, likely based on retention requirements that you have. Okay, um, so audit logs. Again, these can be used for analysis purposes and ensure that maybe something like your admins are doing and acting appropriately. Um, and then you can push your Kubernetes and container microservices metrics to something like Prometheus and do a lot of interesting things. So you can monitor an alert uh, through alert manager on performance metrics, CPU, memory, network, and disk. So this can really correlate events together well. All right. Um, I was going to spend some time diving into how you can leverage tools like Falco to do runtime checks and detection to confirm your security policies are working or to give you visibility if they fail. But I'm not. And before I tell you I'm not, I encourage you to track down uh, Chris Nova or someone else to talk about Falco um, or talk to some of the other vendors in the container security space. They all have products that can help with runtime security, and most of the products even do compliance checks. So pivoting a bit and why I didn't go deeper into things like Falco. Um, I watched past talks that folks gave on containers and different compliance frameworks, mainly PCI, and they mostly evolved around technology. And honestly, this one was going to as well. Um, and then I was bouncing some ideas off my friend Brad for this deck. And by the way, you should see his and Ian's talk. Um, and he, he asked if I was going to talk about how to talk to an auditor. And I said, well, I was going to mention it in a wrap up slide. But the more I thought about it, the more I that we really need to spend more time on that than one slide. Honestly, Zeal and I could probably spend the whole 35 minutes on it, but I'm sure that uh, CFP would never get selected. So you get a few minutes. So Zeal touched on the importance of diagrams early on, but I, I just want to reiterate it here. It doesn't really matter how cloud native, bleeding edge, or uber secure your application, stack, or cloud is if you can't explain it to your auditor. This is why good diagrams are so important. So start with something simple, like segmentation here, and then deal, drill a little bit deeper. So maybe then you talk about how the network is segmented and the controls you have in place. And you know, this slide looks very sim similar to most networks. So then you maybe will, you'll dive a little bit deeper. And this is where you get into maybe the Kubernetes and container specific network controls like network policies, Istio, ingress configurations, et cetera. It's good to talk about how things are similar and different from like traditional VMs or data center deployments and how some of this makes things like 
infrastructure as code and policies a little bit easier. All right, I admit YAML is not that cool, but as far as compliance goes, the YAML used for declaring your Kubernetes plus your Git workflow is self-documenting, uh, meaning you don't have to do anything differently to track down who did what when. Your change history can be tracked in your Git history. This isn't just for your load balancer changes like this slide. It applies to any changes in your cluster managed the same way. It is good to walk your auditor through this and show the change history in peer reviews. Um, great. So now the people part of compliance. This is sometimes the hardest part because after all, we are all human and change can be hard. You need to understand your audience and practice empathy and advocacy. So if you're working on developing a cloud native application that needs to meet compliance requirements, the makers are most likely the folks you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. You probably don't need to convince them of the benefits of cloud native technology, but you can be one of the advocates for the compliance team. So explain the controls you need to meet and how having clear documentation and diagrams will pay off dividends in the end. Explain how the Git workflow they're already using can be used as an audit trail later. So it's very important to have precise commit messages. The internal checkers are the teams whose butts are probably on the line if you're, it's found out your application does not meet compliance requirements. They're also less likely to understand cloud native technologies since it's not really part of their day-to-day -day job. This is where empathy comes in. Put yourself in their shoes. Understand you all work for the same company and ultimately want the same thing, to make money from awesome products and keep the company's name out of the news from security incidents. So invite these folks like the security or GRC teams early and often to your standups or architecture reviews. And then make them feel part of the team and that their opinion matters. You know, invite them to learning sessions and brown bags. And then check in with legal on your diagrams or documentation. And then lastly, the external checkers. So these are the folks that are least familiar with your application and don't necessarily have the same goals as your internal teams, but they're here to help. Some auditors like PCI, QSA, audit systems anywhere from main mainframes to your bleeding edge hipster store. They need to understand a lot of different technology and the training that is often provided to them doesn't cover anything more than like VMs, primarily because compliance frameworks and trainings were written before containers or even cloud. And despite our wonderful little KubeCon bubble, a lot of companies are not using containers. This is where empathy comes in. Understand where your auditor is coming from, but also know that most folks want to learn and understand new technologies that you're using. Take the time to explain the concepts or hopefully involving your security or GRC teams early paid off and they're doing this for you with the auditor. So just a side note, I went to PCI ISA training last year. And let's just say my eyes were really open. Uh, the trainers couldn't answer a lot of my questions when it came to PCI and containers. And because of this, Zeal and I have been actively involved with PCI Council, and we're working with them and other cloud providers on better documentation and cloud training. So the TLDR on this presentation, and yes, we could have started with this, but you might not have stayed, is Kubernetes and cloud native makes compliance a lot easier in places. In some places like logs, it's pretty much the same. Teach people what you know, make cloud native security and compliance less scary. And then automate things, including infrastructure as code and policy as code as much as you can, because this will make compliance less burdensome. And then understand the shared responsibility model between you and your cloud provider. And we're here to help if you have any questions. Thank you.